Welcome. Welcome to Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist. I'm Reverend Matthew, and I'm the newly called minister to share with you in a ministry of engagement and loving and transformation. And I greet you this morning with this wisdom from the Reverend Dr. Hope Johnson. We are one. A diverse group of proudly kindred spirits here, not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and we are proactive. We care deeply. We live our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing, and rejoicing getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, asking questions, listening, living our answers, learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves, apologizing, and forgiving with humility and being forgiven through grace as we create the beloved community together. We are one. And in this spirit, I'd like to invite us all to welcome one another. We have people joining us online, and if you are, I invite you to turn on your cameras, and we may get to see their images Hi, Chris. Right on, on there. Alana. Hi. And what we can do in response is we can all turn and wave to our camera and greet them. As Debbie, one of our leaders for Pastoral Associates, says with this greeting, we are so glad that you all are here today. We are better and we are stronger because we are together. Our Sundays are not possible without us coming together, and nor are they possible without the time and talent of our welcoming team who greeted you as you came in the door. Our children's religious exploration that offers programming to our 10 and under, and if you're quiet, you can actually hear them through this wall. Our hospitality committee, who has been working hard and planning so that you have refreshments and you can stay just a little bit longer after the service. And of course, our audiovisual team, who makes sure that you can see and hear and that those online can also be seen. Along with Summer and Debbie, today's pastoral associates, with Anne, who's our Zoom host, Stacy, our religious exploration professional, 
and Chris, our music director, I wanna offer all of those serving our community this morning our gratitude. Yeah, thank you. For all that you do that draws us together and crafts a time and a place, a container for community, for our multiplicity of actions, relationships, dreams, and beliefs. Over a series of Sundays, to better understand ourselves, how we are called to act, who we are when we gather, what we might imagine together, and how we offer and accept wisdom from one another, we are exploring the multiverse. And what is the multiverse, you might be wondering? Well, we have prepared a video for you that's a little different than last week's, a little bit. What is the multiverse? The multiverse is a hypothetical group of multiple universes. Together, these universes comprise everything that exists, the entirety of space, time, matter, energy, information, and the physical laws and constants that describe them. Multiple universes have been hypothesized in cosmology, physics, astronomy, religion, philosophy, transpersonal psychology, music, and all kinds of literature, particularly in science fiction, comic books, and fantasy. In these contexts, parallel universes are also called alternate universes. Quantum universes, interpenetrating dimensions, parallel universes, parallel dimensions, parallel worlds, parallel realities, quantum realities, alternate realities, alternate timelines, alternate dimensions, and dimensional planes. Examples of the multiverse that you might be familiar with are It's a Wonderful Life, the 1946 holiday classic, when George Bailey wishes he had never been born. We see an alternate reality of the world without him. Most Star Trek shows from the original series through to today incorporate the mirror universe, a dystopian parallel dimension filled with shadow versions of familiar characters. Schrodinger's cat, the thought experiment devised in 1935 by Erwin Schrodinger in conversation with Albert Einstein. It imagines a quantum situation where a cat hidden from view is in a state both alive and dead, implying the existence of quantum realities. While the multiverse sounds like a trip into Unitarian Universalist Rod Sterling's Twilight Zone, it is actually much more close to home than that. It is the potential and possibility of our imagination for both life-giving and destructive realities. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. We are sharing all this with you as we will be shifting into the multiverse next month in our Sunday services. Exploring the multiverse together, we can find great potential and possibility within. Among. Beyond our Mountain Vista home. As we enter the multiverse today, we are actively seeking that potential and possibility in all of our imaginations for both the life-giving and those destructive realities. We are borrowing the symbol of the toasted everything bagel from the multiverse film, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Now in that film, it represents the bleakest of possible futures and the despair that it evokes. We today are employing the Burt Bagel to look through and beyond a disastrous and dystopian future into something brighter. It can be discovered here, between the reality we live in and our imagination. It exists among our fears and our hopes and can be lived into by a single person and only together in community as one. Welcome. It is good to be together.
will be singing, we will be singing as our sacred song, Amazing Grace, three times today. This first one will be the most familiar, but as we live in the multiverse, there are different tunes that you can sing Amazing Grace to, and we will be singing several of them. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. Joel will be our song leader, and the words will be projected. You now, I invite you now to a time of contemplation, of considering and pondering amazing grace. When singing amazing grace as we just have, it is not at all surprising that we Unitarian Universalists, we, we offer you a choice. Sing the word wretch or sing the word soul. It's not surprising because we are a people who believe in the words of the Reverend Rod Richards that what you believe is so important, we will not dictate it to you. We have chosen to remove doctrines and creeds, those right beliefs that you must possess from inside and outside our Unitarian Universalist faith. We are interested and invested in how you experience our world, what you have learned, and what you come to believe is true. As a faith tradition, then, we affirm and promote direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold all life. Now the author of the lyrics of Amazing Grace, John Newton, believed in a doctrine of original sin that each person was by birth wretched, damned to hell, unless they were saved by God. And yet there is a possibility he also believed as we do. On March 10th, 1748, Newton had a spiritual conversion which became an anniversary for, marked in the rest of his life. He related that it occurred while he was a passenger aboard the ship, the Greyhound, 
caught up in a terrible storm and most likely sinking. He prayed and prayed for deliverance from death. And when the storm died down, he converted to evangelical Christianity. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And yet that was not all that was occurring for him on that day on that ship. You see, three years earlier, John Newton was the captain of his very own ship, dealing in the worst atrocity that human beings can portray and can put upon another. Slavery. He was a cruel commander of the ship of that most despicable trade. And he was so like, disliked, excuse me, by his crew that they mutinied. And that for three years afterwards, he suffered the very fate he condemned so many Africans to. He was enslaved in Africa. He was eventually liberated by the crew of the Greyhound. And on the way back to England, was caught in that storm. When he returned to England, his demeanor and his beliefs had completely changed. Eventually, he became an Anglican priest. He wrote several hymns like Amazing Grace. And yet more than all of this, he became a passionate abolitionist, demanding the end of slavery in his country and across the world. He, forgot, he, fought, he fought against the institution of slavery and witnessed its end in 1807 in the United Kingdom, just months before he died. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. His professed belief was that God had saved him, and yet he also recognized that his experience, his direct experience as a slave in Africa changed the direction of his life. Think of that. Amazing grace. Perhaps the divine reaching into life, perhaps the direct experience of grace as the means to change and grow and renew one's own life. We do not say, you must sing wretch or you must sing soul. Instead, we invite you to consider, where do you experience grace in your life? Where is the amazing grace for you? May we so ponder and consider together.
Today's meditation is entitled, Choose to Bless This World, written by the Reverend Rebecca Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice or withhold love? You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless this world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent range, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting, that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude, to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More the choice will draw you into community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. I invite you to contemplate a man who invited us into another dimension, as vast as space and timeless as eternity. In that fertile ground, amid light and shadow, between science and superstition, among our pitfalls and our summits, this man wove cautionary tales of imagination so that we might better perceive our own selves. This man was a writer, social critic, and a visionary, and a dedicated Unitarian Universalist. This man, Rod Serling, creator of The Twilight Zone. Rodman Edward Serling was born December 25th, 1924. His family understood itself as ethnically but not religiously Jewish, and in growing up, he was encouraged 
and his interest in the theatrical arts. In World War II, he served as a paratrooper and then attended Antioch College on the GI Bill, focusing on theater, and then, to our great pleasure, on broadcasting. At Antioch, he met and fell for Carolyn Louise Carroll Kramer. Now, both of their families opposed to the marriage, hoping that he would have ended up with a nice Jewish girl and she with a good Protestant boy. Carol's solution was to become Unitarian Universalists. And so around 1948, they joined the Unitarian Church. They remained active members of congregations on both East and West coasts, strong supporters of our General Assembly and financially generous to our tradition for the rest of their lives. Serling began his career in radio and then transitioned to the emerging meeting medium of television. He would later state that, quote, of all the media, TV lends itself most beautifully to presenting a controversy. He found that with television, he could take a part of the problem and using a small number of people get my point across. Of course, he crafted many notable works during his career, but the most enduring is The Twilight Zone. You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Filled with robots and aliens and constantly eerie situations, it became most famous for its twist endings. But underlying it all, the theme of the show was social justice. Anti-war and equality among people are some of the strongest themes throughout all of Serling's writings. And he constantly crafted stories focused on the power that we hold within and how our choices impact our world. No one could know Serling or view or read his work without recognizing his deep affection for humanity, wrote Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, and his determination to enlarge our horizons <clears throat> excuse me, by giving us a better understanding of ourselves. The Twilight Zone was Serling's vehicle for his humanist, ethically just beliefs. And it's not too much to say that it speaks well of our Unitarian Universalist values. For its 60th anniversary, Adrienne LaFrance, in her article, How the Twilight Zone Predicted Our Paranoid Present, writes, while the Twilight Zone is filled with supernatural phenomena, its underlying message is rooted in reality. It's ultimately a show about all the ways that you can lose yourself to paranoia, to grief, to conformity, I'm sorry, to greed. The Twilight Zone explores what it means to be human with a mix of supernaturalism and civics. More simply, she concludes, it is a program about fear and the price we pay for indulging in it. Serling's invitation through the Twilight Zone and other works was to recognize who we are and when we are afraid. He wanted us to look around, to become aware of the fear that pervades our world, our society, perhaps your heart today. And then he wanted to empower us to recognize that we can act. After his death in 1975, Carol recalled, he often said, the ultimate obscenity is not caring, not doing something about what you feel, not feeling, just drawing back and drawing in. Through the Twilight Zone, Surly invited us on a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination so that we could better see this world 
and so that we might more clearly feel what it is like to be alive, to be alive in a world that does have genuine crisis. Should we be afraid about what is happening in our world, the prejudice, the hate, the violence, yes. And yet Serling wanted us to be more than afraid. He wanted us to recognize and confront our fears with clarity and with courage. He often narrated Twilight Zone episodes, and at the end of episode 22, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, he shared this wisdom. The tools of conquest do not come from bombs and explosions and fallout. There are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices, and these can be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudice can kill, and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all its own. And the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the Twilight Zone. Thank you. A moment ago, Reverend Matthew told you a good bit of the history of Amazing Grace. It's writing by John Newton, probably around 1772. It's publication around 1779. But Newton only wrote the words. He only wrote Amazing Grace. The tune that we call Amazing Grace is a tune called New Britain. It is probably from around the 1830s, possibly the 1840s, which means that that tune wasn't even in existence before Newton died. So Newton never knew that tune. Chances are the tune was sung, the song was sung to some other tune, and it may have changed because in its first publication, it's just published in a collection of texts. There's no music in those hymnals, and that was common practice with hymnals up until a little more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Most hymn books were just collections of text. Later on, they were collections of texts in one place and tunes in another part of the book, so they weren't even together. Eventually, they started being published on facing pages, and then around 120-ish years ago, they started being published in the form that we're used to them, with the text underlaying the music. That's a relatively recent invention. Now the tune New Britain has acquired a whole lot of other baggage along the way, um, including that great uh, Scottish tradition of playing Amazing Grace on the bagpipes, the tune New Britain on the bagpipes, which dates all the way back to the dark ages of 1972. That's the first known recorded use of bagpipes playing Amazing Grace. It's really very recent. That's within many of our lifetimes. Now, what tune would have been sung originally? Well, we don't know. But it did get published with several different tunes, and we're going to actually sing the first and second verse now to one of those other tunes with the help of Joel here, and I'm going to play it through for you once. This is a tune from about 1820 or so, published in the 1860s. It's called Jewett, and I invite you to stand and sing with us. Amazing Grace. It's also managed to acquire a refrain, Shout, shout for glory. The words will be up on the screen in just a moment. I'll play through it once, and then you're invited to stand and sing. This is different. Be bold. Sing with gusto.
sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Shout, shout for glory. Shout, shout aloud for glory. Brother, sister, mourner, all shout glory. Hallelujah. Everybody. Twas grace that taught me hard to fear, and grace my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Shout, shout for glory, shout, shout aloud for glory. Brother, sister, mourner, all shout glory. Imagine, if you will, an everything bagel toasted to the point of being burnt. This inedible bread is a symbol of the most disastrous possibilities in the multiverse that may lay just around the corner. Imagine potentials of destruction, devastation, and doom, inescapable like a black hole, swallowing up all tomorrows. And this is a true story of those whose imaginations are so deeply invested in the toasted bagel future that they receive nothing good. They perceive nothing good emerging from the real world crisis that we face today. Social destruction, environmental devastation, the doom of our entire species. Caught within these frightening potentials, some react in despair, believing that nothing I do matters, and others react with entitled enragement, seeking power over in order to bl blame or simply tear down anything good that exists today. This is the story of one people, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits. They live between reality and imagination, the universe and the multiverse, fact and fiction, science and the supernatural. And with mind and heart and body and spirit, they craft a faith well aware of the looming crisis, but are unwilling to dwell in doom. Instead, they contend with crisis. They struggle for justice, and they reach out for grace. The other day, I was caught up in doom scrolling. I don't know if you've ever participated in that. It's not usually my way to get caught up in reading negative news story after negative news story on my smartphone. Most mornings, I just get up, I get a cup of coffee, and then I sit down with my phone and try to be cautious about how I am reading the news. I do want to know what's going on in the world, but in a balanced way, reading about current, uh, current events and then seeking to understand them with an imagination of how I might fit in. And yet, this morning, before I realized it, my heart was beating quickly and my breath was short. My shoulders had begun to tense up and my stomach was churning. I had been reading article after article about how bad things are getting. News reports predicting worse climate disasters to come, global slavery on the rise, the murders of transgender people 
climbing. The return of polio among children were just some of the news reports that were pulling me, sucking me in. And before I knew it, I had moved beyond my usual concern to genuine anxiety and fear of impending doom. Before I was aware of my body and my emotions, I found myself in despair. And when I had a moment to realize it, to feel my body and my heart, to discover what was happening to me, I took a breath, a deep breath. And then I reached out for grace. Joanna Macy has been my teacher for many years. She is an elder, a nuclear war activist, systems thinker, and a Buddhist. And I've recently heard that she attends a Unitarian Universalist congregation with her family. Her work, her life work, has been focused on the great turning, the personal and social process of shifting away from a future created by our industrialized capitalistic world to something sustaining and life-giving for all. She doesn't offer predictions about what the future holds. Instead, she simply gives the steps by which she believes we must travel to get to a future filled with justice and love and trust and brand new possibility. She does not believe in anything like a burnt everything bagel. But she does teach that feeling despair today and for the world that we can imagine the potential doom of tomorrow is part of that path to bring about a better world despair work she teaches begins with us becoming aware of the negative impact of the news upon us we have to feel it even if it is uncomfortable because it's a genuine signal that something is wrong. She teaches that we experience anger and grief and fear and confusion when we open up to our current reality. Because these feelings are uncomfortable, well, we can attempt to ignore them by distracting ourselves. It's something that we are pretty good at doing. But if we actually feel them, if we bring the experience of life today into our bodies, we gain an opportunity to change them. Not that that's always our reaction. Today, with the prevalence of negative news, the feeling of despair, of anger, of grief, of fear and confusion, well, some people, particularly younger generations, are feeling paralyzed. For them, it is so bleak a future, there is nothing today that they can do. And I recognize that. I do. There are moments when I look around and I begin to imagine the multiple futures in front of us, and I feel that sometimes, too. There are others feeling this despair for the future who are reacting with blame and with shame, and worse, seeing no positive alternatives, they are trying to tear down what good exists today. In fact, it has become an entire political process in our nation. And I witnessed this enraged entitlement of so many people, some of the people I know and I love. But they're all alternatives to these responses Joanna teaches. And these are her words about grace and the great turning. When you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. This is grace. 
Today, we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual selves. We are feeling graced by the other beings and by the earth itself. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act, they give us justice and eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other and the web of life. Our true power comes as a gift, like grace, because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and the beauty and the strengths of our fellow humans and our fellow species, we can go any, into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. Thank you, Joanna. Because this is not a grace that I can find on my own. It's a grace that only exists with and among people. It is not a grace that saves all by itself because there is work that must be done. But it is a grace that transforms anger into justice, grief into love, fear into trust and confusion into an openness to new potentials and possibilities. We cannot find this grace alone. We have to put down our smartphones. We have to stop doom scrolling. And perhaps we need to go get a hug. Certainly is what I had to do the other morning. I had to go out into the world and open myself to the justice and the love and the trust and the so many possibilities for the future that does exist right now alongside those many perils. I had to open myself to grace. To utterly paraphrase and change the ending of Serling's Twilight Zone narration, the tools of grace do not necessarily come from outside us, externally from the world, or as a gift from the divine, yet they can only be found in community. There is compassion that is simply thoughts, attitudes, feelings to be found only among our collective hearts. And for the record, cruelty can end, I'm sorry, kindness can end cruelty, love can destroy hate. And a thoughtfulness, perceiving our anger and our grief and our fear and confusion in our own hearts, it can transform it. And the wonder of all of this is that these things cannot be confined to our own lives when we realize them together. They come alive in our world and create the possibilities of futures yet unimagined. So may it be because we choose to reach for grace together. Amen. Any thoughts you might want to share about our uh, next version of Amazing Grace? The life of a church musician is an interesting one. Among other things, you learn to read things in our hymnals that you never thought you'd ever care about. Like, for example, Amazing Grace is an 8686CM tune, which means four lines eight syllables, six syllables, eight syllables, six syllables, also referred to as common meter, or CM. Uh, as is most of the poetic works of Emily Dickinson, and a lot of other famous hymn tunes and poetic works that have been created throughout the years. Um, occasionally, when church musicians get together after a drink, or three, or more, um, we have fun looking through the metric index in the back of the hymnal that shows you all the tunes that are the same meter. And sometimes you get some humorous and amusing things that happen when you mix up 
tunes with texts that are wildly inappropriate for the, uh, what the text, the tunes in the text are wildly inappropriate for each other. So in that spirit, we're going to sing two verses of Amazing Grace to possibly one of the most wildly inappropriate tunes. It kind of goes with the theme of 60s television with Rod Serling. And I invite you to stand and sing with me verses one and three. Most of you will catch this pretty quickly, I think. So here we go. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that brought my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed, the hour I first believed. Thank you, Reverend Matthew, for today's service. Freud was attributed to saying, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And in this case, a toasted bagel is not just a toasted bagel. One of my takeaways today is recognizing how easy it is to slip down a way of thinking of what's the point, especially when I'm feeling overwhelmed. And it's pretty, pretty easy to stay there. It doesn't require much energy. And part of the balance I've had to find is how to honor that feeling and continuing to try to choose to do more. Being a part of MVUU, hearing the services, speaking with many of you, conversing with you, the groups I've been a part of, Caring Hearts, which I meet with my group every Saturday, all of these I've been a part of for the last few years, they have and they will continue to inspire me to work on choosing to move forward with love. Wherever your journey takes you after this, I invite you to join us afterwards for conversation. As you make your way out of these doors, you'll notice the wooden bowls for contributions for, to MVUU and this month's Woven Basket recipients, Interfaith Community Services. We have invited ICS to give a workshop for our congregation next week, or this week, Wednesday, September 21st at 10.30 a.m. at MVUU on compassionate care with healthy boundaries. They describe it as, this 90-minute workshop speaks to those who take care of others and helps them learn how to give care while setting secure, healthy boundaries. I also want to let you know about the Renew UU gathering set to begin, well, it was set to begin today after the service. It will be postponed until next Sunday. Renew UU is a series of three workshops hosted by Reverend Matthew to engage on UU history, personal journeys, and how MVUU functions. Now starting next week, longtime members, those interested in membership, or those just curious, are all welcome. And today's ending, we will close on. An ending or merely prelude to more glorious beginnings by Michael Schuler. We have reached the end of this time for the gathering of memory and for letting the imagination play with future possibilities. We have enjoyed magic moments and edified each other. Shall it be concluded then? Or will this adventure now commenced continue? Our separate paths converging, meeting, merging in the unending quest for love more perfect. The joyous struggle for meaning more sufficient and life more abundant. Is this ending to be an ending or merely prelude to new more glorious beginnings? I pose the question, in your hearts lies the answer. Go if you must, stay if you can. Thank you and blessed be. I just want to sneak in one quick commercial announcement. The choir has restarted. 
We have a number of exciting musical things coming up. Drop me a note at chris.tackett at mvuu.org and I'll make sure you're on the mailing list to get all the information about that. That was also in the newsletter this week. And with a Sunday service built entirely out of amazing grace, I feel like I can't leave it without singing one more verse together. So for postlude, would you all stand and sing with me? I promise it's not Gilligan's Island this time. <laughs> 